Today on Real Life, is the stock market dead on real money? Arlene Williams shares another great recipe in the Real Life Kitchen and the dangers of organizations affected by mission drift. Today on Real Life. God loves you. Jesus died for you. The Holy Spirit, he empowers you. And the Bible is your guide to abundant life. I'm Don Black with my co-host, Amanda Brocker. Hello, young lady. You, you slipped my little knuckle thing because you're wearing all that jewelry. I didn't want to hurt you. You didn't want to crush my hand. Just give, give him a little bit of a break. Well, I hope you're well. I am. I'm actually a little stiff. I got to take part in a 5K oh. without much, like, rehearsal or practice. Uh -huh. So, you know, you're a little bit sensitive after that. You know, man, I don't think they call it preparing for a race rehearsal. Okay, well, <laughs> that's, that's race rehearsal. You know where you rehearsal. run? You can even run in place in your house. Yeah, but yeah, I didn't yeah, do yeah. any of that. Yeah. So I was feeling it a little bit, but it was awesome. But I you finished. made it. 36 minutes, 14 wow. seconds. Wow. Yes. You didn't I just make it. You did it really well. I was very nauseous at the end, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, but praise God. It was all for missions. We raised was, money for missions. missions. My daughter gets to go to El Salvador at the oh, end good. of June. Good, so good, we're good. excited. Well, we're in June. Mm -hmm. The summer has arrived in, our, right. in our world. We've got, we've got this beautiful weather that we're working with. Mm -hmm. Here in, in the Pittsburgh area, it's very, it's spring time. Sweet. with all of the flowers growing. So it's a beautiful time of the year. It is a happy time in Pennsylvania. But you know what's, you know what's right around the corner? What's that? This weekend. This weekend. I do know. Tell us. It's Pentecost. Pentecost Sunday. That's right. This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Somebody at home goes, okay, well, what's that mean? Pentecost is a significant mm -hmm. celebration for the church. This is actually when the church was birthed. It was the birthday of the church. Read the first, second chapter of Acts. Go look at that scripture. And you know, Amanda, that's where the Holy Spirit came and we actually, he actually takes up residence in us and makes us the body of Christ. That's right. That's what happened at Pentecost. Mm -hmm. It's really where the paradigm shift with God and man, God on the outside became God on the inside. And think of Peter before and after. Before and after, yeah, that's right. It, it changes that's, our life. The Holy Spirit does. We say it. He's a he, person. Yes, he, he changes our life. He changes our life. And we believe at Cornerstone, we believe in the power of God is the mm -hmm. same today. It will be the same tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And it's the same power and blessing that will be in the millennial reign. You know, Jesus prayed, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's right. To now. That's right. So we believe that. And we're having yeah. a special program this Saturday night. This Saturday night. You see the, the, the graphics are running right now. We call it our Signs and Wonders special. And we're going to have a live studio audience. We have a small studio. So there's, you've got to call 412-349-4298. Write that phone number down. If it's busy, call back. We can only take just a few people, but we're going to have a time of prayer. Our Signs and Wonders team our Friday program is going to be here with Pastor Gary and Arlene and Norma, myself, with a very special music guest. Mm He's -hmm. going to come and minister with us and to us in music and praise and worship. And we're going to believe God for healings and for deliverances and for mm -hmm. His presence, just like at Pentecost. That's right. I'd love to see, I'd love to hear the mighty rushing wind. Amen. The, Amen. As a mighty rushing wind. I love mm -hmm. to hear that. I don't, and we don't live in, in, in our walk with Christ. In, in, the, in, in the feelings level. But isn't it good when you feel the presence of God? That's right, that's right. And we do wanna make sure that we have enough room for them. That is a, a mailbox. So they'll actually let a message where they need to let their name and how many guests and maybe a contact okay. number back. So when, they, when you call the number, you're gonna go into a voice mailbox mm -hmm. and they're gonna leave the information. We'll get back in touch with you. Mm -hmm. Well, the scripture is all that we found ourselves on. The founding of this ministry and the, the establishment of this ministry is in the scripture. Second Corinthians 5, 17 is our scripture nugget for this morning. And the word says, 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. New things have come. God has created in us, in Christ, new things. You have the opportunity to have new and abundant life. A life that's worth living. A life that goes on for eternity. That's the message we want you to hear today. You're watching this program because God's ordained you to watch it. And we believe he has a special message for you today. So stay tuned. We have some wonderful guests in the studio. We've got some great teaching coming. We have some wonderful music coming. You're at the right place. We want to hear from you. You can email us at family at ctvn.org. And our prayer partners are always standing by right. to stand with you in prayer and believe God. Mm -hmm. Man, did you know our prayer partners are a tremendous group of men and women? Yes. And when they take the call... You know, we are seeing lives being changed every day. Mm. You know, in Christ, he brings that newness every day. So I encourage you to give us a call at 888-665-4483. We would love to pray with you. Well, that's why we're here. We're here really to be uh, salt and light, to be part of your family and you're mm -hmm. part of our family. So welcome to this program. Let's start it off with Jason Bear as he sings for us, You Found Me. Jason. We're so glad that he found us and became our salvation. I was weak and insecure, broken and frail, blinded by a cloud of darkness. I had lost my way and crawling on my knees through the wind. And through the pouring rain You were looking for me And ran to me when I called your name And you found me I'll never be the same Completely You changed my world that day When you found me took me in your arms and that was my escape all it took was love and grace to help me break away and now i'm dancing free and i'm falling more in love with you because you are all i need and i love the way you rescued me when you Never be the same completely. Oh, you changed my world. Yes, you changed my world. It's important to know how and where to invest your money. You know, you work hard for the money and you want it to have a positive return. 
especially as you approach retirement or maybe you're in your retirement eight uh, years and you're on a fixed income, for some, the stock market has been an opportunity to increase their nest egg. Yet others question that, is it a, still a good place to put their hard-earned uh, cash? Our next guest can help us sort through the pros and cons of this, of this uh, mystery. Ted Kerr is the managing partner of Touchstone Capital Incorporated here in Pittsburgh. And Ted, we want to welcome you back onto the program. Thank, Thank, you. You, Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, it is, it is, my mother-in-law called me just last week and she said, Don, what should we, what should I do with my little bit of savings that I have? Mm. What, what should I do with it? Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to tell her. Mm -hmm. So Ted, what, sh what should you do with it? <laughs> <laughs> Help me out, man. Let me condense 20 years of experience down into a single question. Um, it's complicated, obviously, and I think that's what drives people away from setting up a plan is because they don't know where to start. Uh, I think the important thing that I wanted to bring up today is because a lot of people are raising questions about whether to invest in stocks or stock mutual funds at all, mm -hmm. because we've gone through a very difficult decade. We've had two significant declines, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are saying, you know, should I even trust investing in the stock market anymore, whether I'm old or young, regardless of what my goals are? And I think it's, it's a common enough question that I thought it was something that maybe we should have a conversation around, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, it is a common question. Mm -hmm. Very important question. Mm -hmm. Because as you face, what am I going to do with this resource that I've been trusted with? Exactly. You know, you think of the parable of the talents. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, and these three individuals that took the talent, mm -hmm. different varied amounts, but they were responsible for being good stewards with it. Mm -hmm. How do you be a good steward with the resources? So there are different types of investments, and stocks are typically associated with long-term goals. So if you're a young parent who just had a child you want to save for college education 15, 18 years away, that would be a typical long-term investing goal that would involve stocks. If you're saving for retirement, obviously that would be another typical response to when should you invest in stocks. But today, people are concerned that stocks might be dead, that, that they have no future in investing because so much money was lost in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most important things that investors can do is try to stand back and be more objective. We tend to see the world from where we stand. And with all the people who have lost jobs or gone through transitions in their workplace, they sense what's going on in terms of the government or in other parts of the world that there's a lot to be concerned with. And as a result, they see the stock market, they see their investments through the lens of all of that concern. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the stock market and stocks in general here in the United States are as strong financially as they've ever been. I mean, that's, that's a news report to most people. Their balance sheets are as clean as they've ever been. With low interest rates, they've paid off debt, they've refinanced. Of course, they've laid off workers, which hurts certain segments of the population. But in terms of the corporate world, they're very profitable. Companies are as profitable as they've ever been. And I could give you other reasons to support that if you look at the stock market and companies objectively, that really are a great place to invest right now. And that's a news account to most people. Well, it is. When you watch the news, there's all the talk of the bubble breaking and, mm -hmm. you know, reached its, it's mm -hmm. going to, the stock market's time to adjust mm -hmm. itself, you know, and all this, this mm -hmm. kind of uh, rhetoric. And I'm not sure that a person that watches the news mm -hmm. and has a little bit of a nest egg feels comfortable to put it mm -hmm. investment into the stock market well there's always reasons not to invest and so there was a time in uh, a while back i had a poster in my office on my wall and it was called the wall of worry and it was about a 50-year chart of the stock market and every so many years there was a news headline printed that that was rather dramatic and it certainly would be memorable to anyone who had lived through that and yet there it was, the stock market going up and up and up over a long period of time. Of course, with periodic periods of pullback. But there's always reasons not to invest. There is always a wall of worry that we face. Mm -hmm. And yet we need to look at it more objectively and realize that long term, there is usually not a better place to put your money. Over a long, what's long term mean? How many years? Ten or more years. Ten or more years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ten or more I was years. in a mock stock market back in my high school days. Uh -huh. But uh, I thought it was really neat to see if it would have been real, I would have been a millionaire because it was like Microsoft and <laughs> Apple days back in the mid-90s. Yeah. 
but uh, you know, for someone who wants to invest today, what are the steps? Like who, where do they go? What mm -hmm. do they do? Well, of course, you could choose to, to call and work with a personal financial advisor, but mm -hmm. really most people have access to some type of 401k or some type mm -hmm. of savings plan through their work. And they only have so many investments they can choose from. So the place to start is with your employer-sponsored plan mm -hmm. and to get help from those who have been appointed to service that plan to help you to understand what options are available to you. You could take this complicated world of investing and boil it down to maybe a half a dozen options. And so it's, a lo it's gonna be a lot less complicated than most people realize. And after a half hour or an hour conversation with a, a servicing agent from that plan, you can get a handle on which of the best, which of the investments would be most appropriate for your age and mm -hmm. proximity to your financial goals. Well, are there other things, Ted, that in, in conjunction with the stock market, may be good places for you to invest money? Mm -hmm. Some people like real estate. Mm -hmm. Other people like bonds, for instance. Mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your thoughts about that? So one rule of thumb is that you should invest the amount of money in bonds that is the percentage uh, equivalent to your age. So if you're 55 years old, you should have 55% of your money in bonds. Uh, that's a rule of thumb, and I think, like many other rules of their type, uh, can get you into trouble if you, if you drill down and invest in that manner uh, too legalistically. But it gives you a sense that there are times of life where you should have more bonds than stocks. Um, so bonds are a, a reasonable place to invest. They generate income and relative safety of principle. Real estate, you mentioned, is also a, a great form of investing. You know, the institutional investors that invest for endowments and invest for other large investors, they have large chunks of investment real estate in their portfolio, but the average retail investor has virtually none. And so that's typically a hole in the investment portfolio that if investors look in the right places, they can also add some exposure to real estate as well. Mm -hmm. So if you, have a, if you have a client who is uh, approaching retirement, mm -hmm. and the, the, of course, I, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of guy who doesn't think retirement really is a biblical process. Yeah. You know? yeah. We should never retire, we should just uh, reinvigorate. Uh -huh. But say you're at a place where you're ready to leave a job mm -hmm. and you're gonna go on to something else. What's your best advice to them with it, like their 401k or mm -hmm. whatever monies they have put aside up to this point mm -hmm. uh, to get them ready for that transition? Mm -hmm. Well, starting earlier is better than starting later. later. Um, I have a joke that when people come to me two months before retirement and want to do retirement planning, I call it damage control because at that point there's not a lot you can do um, to set up for a better retirement. But for those people who are on the threshold of a significant life change, such as something approaching retirement, um, sitting down and plotting out where is their income going to come from. You know, most people are going to be eligible for Social Security. Some people might get a pension through their employer or perhaps a past employer. Uh, how much income can your investments generate? So putting together a working plan that will involve their invest investing income and pension income replacing their earned income. Um, so it's, it's actually more simple than people realize. You just have to pull out a back of an envelope and a pen and, and start putting together that income plan to cross over that threshold successfully. There's an opportunity. A lot of people miss this opportunity. I want you to listen to me when I tell you about this. There's an opportunity as you approach the career transition and you've put aside monies that you have in, in your retirement and then you don't know what you want to do next. You, there's a ministry opportunity that you face a chance for you to start redirecting your focuses and say, well, I can now volunteer. I can now get involved in ministry. I can go out and do mission work. Mm -hmm. I can do, I've got, I can self fund to do these things. Mm -hmm. Rather than think of yourself as ending, see it as a new beginning. Mm -hmm. And as you go to this next place, God can use you in more powerful ways than you've ever been used before because you're now available. You know, Ted, and that's, that's a lot to do with how God uses when we're available. That's right. And what better availability than someone who's young, still young, mm -hmm. has financial uh, security of sort, mm -hmm. and now can focus themselves yeah. on working on God's kingdom. kingdom Absolutely. That's right. We want to thank you, Ted. Thank, thank you for Amen. taking time with us. My pleasure. Coming and sharing God with, with us thank great you. wisdom. Yes. We need to learn. Yeah. And, and, and if you're approaching that time or you're maybe somebody you know needs advice. Seek out good advice. You know, find good counsel. Just don't let 
things slide. Make a change. We'll be right back. Later on Real Life, author Peter Greer explores what can happen when an organization experiences mission drift. Pastor John Geth continues his teaching series on the seven minute word. And coming up next, Arlene Williams is back in the Real Life Kitchen to show you how to make another great dish. That's next on Real Life. I have fond memories of being a guest with Norma and Russ Bixler on Cornerstone. 35 years, that's quite an accomplishment. But you know what? It's an accomplishment of 35 years of walking in purity and integrity before God. Congratulations. Join Dr. Frida Cruz, licensed professional counselor, and her guests as they provide practical solutions to real life problems on Time for Hope. Can ancient secrets of the supernatural be rediscovered? Do angels exist? Is there life after death? Are healing miracles real? Can you get supernatural help from another dimension? Has the future been written in advance? Sid Roth has spent 30 years researching the strange world of the supernatural. Join Sid on It's Supernatural. Welcome to the Real Life Kitchen. Arlene is going to teach us another great recipe today. Well, I'm so glad you're here today. <laughs> Me too. It's always good to be, and we're so glad that you joined us. And today, you know what? I, I, I called a, a lady that has watched at home for a lot of, of years, and she had sent me something I called to thank her. And she said, Arlene, let me give you this recipe. She said, you're not going to believe it. And I, a lot of people tell me that, and most of the time I don't believe it. And this one, she said, it only has three or four ingredients now that's what we like to hear right i sure do okay take a pound of chuck okay. that's our pound thank you to joe liga's beef farm Yay, up there we appreciate you. thank you so much you guys are such a blessing to us thank you one pound of ground chuck one package one package of any kind of stovetop dump it in there all right okay now you know what's in there you have all your flavorings you have your onion flavoring you have celery parsley and no salt, no pepper, no egg, and one cup of water. All right. You just pour it in there. The, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Just I'm pour really it in. liking this recipe. Now you're going to mix that up. Okay. And you know what you're going to have? The best tasting meat cakes that are just like a meatloaf. Three ingredients. I'm telling you, you can have dinner on the table in 30 minutes, literally, because these only bake at 350. I know what I'm having you tonight. <laughs> You have to squish fast because okay. so we, we have to divide that. What you're going to do is divide it into 12 portions. I've already sprayed this with some Pam. And you know how when you get meatloaf, you like that little crunchy part around the edge that cooks hard? This, because we're making individual ones, you get that little crunchy part around the edge on all of them. And then the next day, this makes 12. Wow. The next day you have lunch because you're going to make meatloaf sandwiches. All right. What's so hard about Sounding this? Sounds even better. I know. <laughs> okay, let's see what you got there. I think How's you're probably doing? there. All right, now, here's the key. You say, well, how am all I going right. to make sure I have 12 equal portions? Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting way. Let me show you how you do. You push this all together so you kind of have it uniform. Mm -hmm. Now, this is why it was important to learn your fractions when you were in school. Because right. now we need 12 portions. We're going to cut one portion in half. Right, now, each of these portions 
need to be six. very good. Awesome. I know you passed. <laughs> so you break it again in, in half. Now you take this portion and you make three out of this portion and then they're even. Okay. Okay, let's start making them real quick. All right. All you're going to do is roll them in a ball and you take a third of each portion. And as you break them apart, just lay them in there until you roll it into a ball. And then you push down lightly on the top. Not real hard, but just lightly. Get this out of here so everybody can see what we're doing. Uh, I, you know, I said, Betty, does this really work? She says, Arlene, I live by myself. I make them. And of course, you can't eat 12 at a time, so I freeze them. And she said, I pull them out. A couple days, I'll have two more for dinner. You can put oh, a, you can have idea. a baked potato, do a vegetable, mm -hmm. and in no time you have dinner. That's the kind of stuff that we all like to do. That's right. And that works well. Again, you want to just pull it apart to make sure you have enough to make your three. Preheat your oven at 350. It's really important. Really important. And you know, when you are making things like this for your family, sometimes it's an extra effort, but it pays off in the long run. Because you know, you're making memories every day with your kids, and you want them to be good memories. Boy, remember when mom used to make those meat cakes, they'll be saying. There remember when go. mom used to do this, mom used to do that. And that's what you want, those kind of memories, not, oh, we went through McDonald's again and we that's had that right. burger or whatever. You don't want to do that. Now, you don't have to do this. And Betty didn't say, mm -hmm. but I take my barbecue sauce, push it down a little bit to make it flat, and I just give it a little squirt because this adds extra flavor. We all love yeah. this barbecue sauce. Ah, just a little bit on top, kind of make a glaze. Mm -hmm. ah, there you go. And again, as I said, a baked potato with this, nice big salad. Oh my goodness, we're talking delicious. And in 30 oh, minutes, yeah. look at that. Put those babies in the oven. Look Amazing. what we just made. Do you know if you made a regular meatloaf, you'd still be chopping onion? We already That's made right. it. Go ahead. You want to pop that in the top sure oven? Will. When we come back, we're going to show you the ways you can use this to serve to your family. But I want to remind you that the recipe is always at CTVN. And you can actually go there, watch the segment again. You can download the recipe, and you can have it in your files. So when you go to make it, you'll be sure you have it. It's always a pleasure when you come by. And it just wouldn't be the same without you. But don't you go away, because we're going to come back, and we're going to have a tasting. That's right. Oh, and maybe we'll get Don to taste it. He'll like really enjoy yeah, this. Yeah, these guys like me around Yeah, they here. do. They do. <laughs> All right, we'll be back in just a minute. But stay tuned now. The life of a single mom can just be too much. Between having to work full time to pay the bills, then one day while cleaning up, I turned on Cornerstone. They had a phone number I could call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and someone would pray for me. These people took the time. They listened and just prayed. Cornerstone is there for me. They take the time to invest in their viewers. It's not just pictures on the screen. It's people that care. That's Cornerstone, and that's the difference. Thanks to you, Cornerstone Network is able to provide wholesome family programs that bring the good news of Jesus Christ to viewers around the world. Did you know that your support is making a difference in someone's life? Think about that. For 35 years, your gifts to Cornerstone have provided family-friendly television around the clock, entertaining and encouraging the entire family, bringing the love of God to a world in need. Thank you again. Your support is impacting lives with the love of Jesus Christ. Do you ever wonder what happens behind the scenes at Cornerstone Network? You can find out with the Real Life Today newsletter. It is full of information, inspiration, and personal stories. But the best part is the program schedule. If you ever think there's nothing good on TV, you don't have the right information. Get the program guide, music, movies, ministries for believers like you and me. Call 888-665-4483 or ctvn.org. I'm always so blessed when someone says our program is the fastest and most uplifting television program. I know you feel the same, Jack. And that's because good news travels fast, Rexel. And let me say this, the world is hearing nothing but doom and gloom on the news at night. But we can tell you the good news, this world will never end. Ephesians 3.21, for it's a world without end. Please make time and join us this week. Don't miss the next Jack Vanapie Pre
Any solid organization should have a clearly defined mission. And without it, the members or the employees can't expect to fulfill the purposes of the organization. Our next guest, Peter Greer, is the president and chief executive officer of the ministry organization, Hope International. And he has authored the book, Mission Drift, outlining the dangers of what happens when an organization loses its way. Peter, welcome to Real Life. Thanks for having me. So glad that you're here with us. You know, sometimes we, we as, as individuals, we, we, we care about ministry. Mm -hmm. We care about organizations, whether it's a church or whether it's a, an organization we support. But your work highlights that sometimes organizations can start slipping away from their, their purposes and their call. Right. How does, how does that happen? Yeah, so really, the book was kind of a personal research project um, as working with a ministry, Hope International. Our goal was to make sure that in five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, mm -hmm. that the heartbeat of this organization has not changed. And the heartbeat being, yes, we want to eradicate extreme poverty, but we also want to make sure that we're not just doing that, that we're introducing individuals to the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so many organizations start with a similar heartbeat, start with a similar purpose of a physical and spiritual purpose and mission. And yet today, it's oftentimes hard to find that spiritual mission still in existence. Mm -hmm. And so we started asking questions of ourselves, how does mission drift happen? And what practically can we do, not just for the organizations we work with, but all the organizations that we care about? How can we make sure that they don't lose the full mission of what they were created to do and created to be? And what we found is there's not one simple issue, there's not one cause, but oftentimes it's a series of different causes and it happens slowly, it happens incrementally, mm -hmm. and that's why we use the word drift, because it's not like there's a dramatic moment, it's a series of small decisions that when compounded by time lead to a dramatically different place. Well, can you give us an example of an organization that might have taken that kind of mm -hmm. path and started to drift or, or drifted away? Unfortunately, it's really easy to find organizations that have drifted. It's much more difficult to find organizations that have truly remained mission true. But some of the well-known ones, uh, initially Harvard University, created with a mission statement to be plainly instructed and consider well that the main end of your life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ. Passionate group of people saying, let's educate, let's make sure that the gospel is at the very core of our education. Now, Harvard is a fantastic university doing great things, mm -hmm. but I would say it's not staying true to the mission that it has. Or consider George Williams, uh, 1844, wanted to found an outreach to individuals on the streets of London. Mm -hmm. And so he created the Young Men's Christian Association, otherwise known as the YMCA. Mm -hmm. Now, I grew up going to the YMCA, and it was a great place to play racquetball, but I had no idea that the heartbeat of the YMCA was to make sure men and women were knowing the good news of Jesus Christ. And so the question is how, if that's the natural path, if that's the, organiz if that's the path that many organizations take, how do we take practical steps to prevent against it? Well, why is it the path that organizations take? I mean, why do they drift? What's, what's, the, uh, what's the motivation for that slide away from cause and mission? There are a lot of issues. I think one of the primary ones is what is measured and what is celebrated. So for a lot of organizations, if they are strictly measured on percent to program, which is important, on the uh, um, size of their budget, and on the number of people reached, all of those are good indicators. But if you are just driven by those three indicators, you're going to do anything to grow. You're going to do anything to do more ministry without asking the more important question, which is what is the quality of the ministry? What really is happening? And yet it's hard to measure that. So we just celebrate growth and growth rates and all that. And again, those are good things, but they're incomplete to determine whether or not an organization is truly staying on mission. Does that happen over generations of leadership? Yeah, there was one quote that we heard that, that said, in essence, that the passions of the first generation become the preferences of the second generation and become irrelevant to the third wow. generation. So oftentimes, uh, that, that happens slowly. There's an interesting story that uh, Phil Vischer, who's the founder of Big Idea, that created VeggieTales. Mm -hmm. And as he created veg VeggieTales, he brought in a corporate CEO who, again, had all the right credentials. 
But as Phil Vischer tells this story, he says, at a meeting, he stood up and said, the purpose of this company is to introduce kids to the message, the good news that's found in Christ. And at that moment, the corporate CEO stands up after being in position for two years and says, if that's what this organization is all about, then I need to opt out. So somehow the very heartbeat and purpose of the organization, the founder's passion, was somehow not seen as an essential element for the successors. And too often that happens, that you find a founding generation that's so passionate, mm -hmm. but sometimes they don't articulate what are they passionate about. Right. And for so many, it's more than just good acts of service. Those are good things, but for so many organizations, it really is founded with a spiritual mission as well. And, and that's really what we're passionate about, is saying, yes, we want to grow, Yes, we want to professionalize. Yes, we want to do good work. But we want to remember the core purpose for which we were created. That's right. And not let donor dollars confuse us. You know, when we're out doing ministry, I like you had brought up in your book about, you know, the opportunity to receive a large check. But if you will do less of the Christ-oriented right. ministering, and it's like, but that, when that's your heart, you know, be bold enough to stand up and say, we're right. not changing. And that was not an easy decision. So that was a large corporation that wanted to fund the Ministry of Hope International. And they loved the microfinance work. They loved the way that we were alleviating mm -hmm. poverty by helping people have jobs and restore dignity. Mm -hmm. And as much as they love that, though, they said, we're a publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. If you tone down the Jesus talk, we'd love to get behind you in a much more significant way. Right. And it was that offer. How much is your mission worth? Yes. Is it worth toning down the Christian identity so that you can reach more people? And as an organization, we, we wrestled with that. We thought through that and we said, our full mission is not for sale. I'd rather receive a limited amount of funding and be true to Amen. who we're created to be Amen. than have explosive growth and somehow water down or compromise on our Christ-centered identity. What our mission is. You know, that's true, Peter. It happens in the churches. Churches have, over the last 15, 20 years, there's been this move to seeker-friendly, to have that seeker-friendly experience so that we don't offend anybody. We're inclusive of everybody, but in that process, take much of the gospel out of the message. Take the cross off the, off the stage. Take, take talk, quit talking about salvation. Quit talking about being baptized. Quit talking about lifestyle issues, but just stay kind of in the, in the experience and in warm and friendly type of a, a place. And Willow Creek was a big uh, leader in that. And I, I saw the study, they released a study about a year ago mm -hmm. that came back and said, you know, we're changing back to the gospel. We're moving back to a place where we present the truth of the gospel. And I remember what Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, mm -hmm. which is the power of God into salvation. You know, good things without power is really anemic. Mm -hmm. Everybody tries to do good, or should, well, everybody should try to do good, right. but without the power of God That's in right. the work, then That's it's right. anemic. It Maybe right. big, maybe global in its scope, but it's anemic in its impact. So I think that's, that's mm -hmm. what we see changing. And now, do you, have you looked at churches when you were looking at this mission drift? Did you look oh, at yeah. churches? Yeah, we absolutely have. And I think whether it's a church or whether it's an organization or whether it's a school. The principles we believe apply across the board. But one of the key issues is to say, we're absolutely not saying change is bad, right? I mean, there are so many examples. We, we look at the example of Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, not in a Christian sense, but was created as a stagecoach company. Stagecoach companies are no longer in existence. But what they said is our mission is to transport people's valuables and stagecoaches were a means to do that. Mm -hmm. And so in a similar way for a church or a college or whatever the organization is to say, what's our core purpose? And what would we rather go out of business than compromise on? And to say, let's be really clear. Let's make sure that is documented. Let's make sure we screen for that. Let's make sure we pray about that. Let's make sure that that's at the very core. Mm -hmm. And for churches to not be clear about what's in their core. And then that allows you actually to change and adapt in more appropriate ways, in ways that don't compromise the core, but are necessary in a changing world. And I think that simple act of clarity of saying, not just how do we accomplish it, 
But why are we created? What is at the core of our identity, of our passion and our purpose? What's our distinctive? What's our God-given distinctive as an organization? Is it to exist? If our, if our reason for Cornerstone to be here is to exist, it's ba that's a bad reason. It's to be an employer, it's a bad reason. Our reason for being here is to, is to fulfill God's purposes for this organization. And that's the distinctive that, that we share. Now, who's, who, can, who do you, did you write this book for? What's the, what's the person or the group that you targeted this for? Yeah, initially it was written for the staff and board of Hope International. Initially, it was not really meant even to be a book. It was really meant to be, how do we live out these principles? What we found and what we've been thrilled about, though, is that the principles really do seem to have incredible applicability to anyone who cares passionately about a cause. So anyone who is a supporter, anyone who is a volunteer, anyone who is a board member, anyone who is an employee, and again, whether that's a church or whether that's a nonprofit or whether that's a ministry, I really hope that the the, the principles are applied. And one practical thing, we created a survey as well for every organization to do a self-assessment mm -hmm. to say, where are we on the course of drift? Have we taken the steps to clarify our mission, to clarify our purpose, and to take practical steps to protect it? And so again, we just hope it's a practical way for people to think about their mission and uh, again, to stay mission true for years and years to come. That's right, it's a biblical principle. We've got to keep the word of God before us That's to right. remember who we are because it's right. a mirror to us. That's right. Who, who are we and why are we here? Mm -hmm. That's right. And I like there's one part in your book that you talk about the annual de declaration of the vision yes. of a company or yes. organization to make sure everybody's on board and we're all still going toward the goal that God's given them. So. That's right. Well, I could say this, Peter. Cornerstone has been on a path. God ordained established path for 35 years, actually 45 years. Mm -hmm. And we're so privileged that God's That's path right. hasn't diverted, yeah. you know, right. that we stay in tune with that. And we're so mm -hmm. glad. Thank you for coming and sharing this important work yeah. with us. And if we'll, we'll put we'll put a link to how they can get the book, Great. maybe to your website and to your to your ministry on our mm -hmm. site. But uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you. God Amen. bless you. Great to be with you. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you. And Amanda, tell, me, tell us about what's coming up next. All right. Well, it's time for today's Bible study. Our teacher this week is Dr. John Guest, senior pastor at Christ Church at Grove Farm in Sewickley, Pennsylvania. His series is called Intimacy with God, and he continues his teaching now on today's 7-Minute Word. Well, here we are again talking about intimacy with God, and we're talking to it or about it under the title of prayer, to be able to talk to God and in that talking to Him have this personal intimate relationship, calling Him Father, that allows us to come, share our hearts, our dreams, our aspirations, as well as our failures and our needs with Him. But directly Jesus, in teaching us to pray, said our Father, He goes on to say, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The opening prayer requests or expressions in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus is teaching us when he teaches us how to pray is all about God. It's not about us, it's about him. He's our Father, he's in heaven, and to pray, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed mean, meaning honored, to be holy, regarded highly, respected, not to take his name in vain, but to have it somehow set up and glorified, to be honored. It's about God. As it goes on to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We'll deal with that tomorrow. But right now, to be talking about God who is in heaven and that his desire is for us, as we pray, to honor him show great regard for him, to see that he is in everything we do and how we express ourselves and in prayer, hallowing, making holy his name. What you've got here side by side is the intimacy with God and the transcendency of God. It's amazing how you can put those two together. Intimacy to call him dad, but he's a heavenly father and it's hallowed be thy name. That is, holy be thy name. 
And that's speaking about the transcendency of God. And it's amazing how you can hold those two together. God isn't just buddy-buddy. He is the great God of the whole universe and Savior of the world in sending his son Jesus. And he is to be held in high regard. It's wonderful that he wants us to be intimate with him, have this relationship. But given who he is, he is holy, holy, holy. The worship of heaven adores him. He is the centerpiece of that worship. And whether it's in church or how we live our lives and do our work, it's to see him honored. I remember when I first became a believer, I didn't even really have a Bible at the time. Somebody gave me a Bible and uh, I began to read and I realized that the whole of my life, what I did with myself, how I spoke, was something that I could honor God by. So in England, I was really into soccer. And I remember lining up on the soccer field and looking at the guy at the other end who I was going to be spending a lot of time with that day, who was my opposing number, and speaking to God and asking him to help me play soccer the way I, could, in a way that I could honor him and let the other guy know too that I was playing a good game and a clean game, not to just deliberately foul, as is so often the case in soccer today. So now I have a God who is a part of my life. I began to talk to him about dating, about shopping, about what I would do with my life, about my career. I began to talk to him. I was trained to be an engineer, and I began to talk to him about what I was designing within that engineering field, sharing it with him, wanting to honor him. I wanted to live my life in such a way that other people would know that I was his. I remember with the neighbor next door to where I was living in London at the time, and uh, I could hear this man wailing in the house. It was a strange sort of thing. Uh, he was ill, and I, I didn't know what the deal was, so I went and knocked on the door and asked the people who were living if I could meet with the man who had whatever it was that was making him wail and uh, cry out, and they let me go see him. Well, his room was an absolute mess. It was foul. It stank so that it's almost as if I needed to run out and get some fresh air out of doors. I cleaned up his house and uh, his room, that is, helped make him comfortable. And here I was, just a teenager of maybe 19 years of age. And what was I doing? I was loving the guy. I wanted him to come to know the Lord. But in this, I wanted the people with whom he was living to know that I was honoring the Lord. It was about me wanting to live for God and be faithful to him and express his love. It wasn't that they might think I was great. I wanted them to know that I belonged to the Lord. Now, we all have that opportunity from time to time. In fact, I would say day after day in how we do things, whether it's how we drive, how we spend our money, how we use our mouth, what our intentions are, what our dreams are, what is our great purpose for living. And in all of it, we should be praying, hallowed be thy name. Lord, be honored in the way I live. Be honored in the way I speak. Be honored in my relationships. That's what he's looking for. Let's pray quickly. Lord, thank you that you give us the responsibility of bringing honor to you here on earth. May people meet you and see you in us because of the way we live. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Right here, ready to eat. That's what we're here to do. Well, I told you. Now, look, this is what they, we just took these out of the oven. These are hot. All you do is take your little knife, go around the edge, you pierce it, and there's your little meat cake. <laughs> is that awesome? Delicious. That's what they look like. These are cool. We made a batch ahead of time. And we put them on a sandwich. Now, you can either taste these, Dawn, you yeah, and yeah. Amanda, or you, I cut one in half. We just put it on a bun, plain little sandwich bun, and put a pickle on top because that kind of cuts through the barbecue on there. Uh -huh. Which would you like to taste? 
Help yourself. Well, first. Oh, well, I better go first. with a, a bite of a yeah, regular one. There's, there's, a, there's a fork and a knife over there. Okay. Help yourself. Well, we, we watched you make them, so we know well, exactly what's in them. them huh? Well, I, absolutely. Taste. <laughs> I've never been known to turn down tastes. I know, because you're food. good at that. I'm That's, a good you're taster. A pro. You're a pro. <laughs> I'm a pro. You're a pro, Don. I'm an expert food I've taster. I've been wanting to tell you about thank that. Thank you very much. Yeah. And see, I enjoyed, I enjoyed uh, Pastor's teaching, too. Yeah. I yeah. can refer oh, yeah. back mm -hmm. to it. The intimacy with God. No, what can, you can't beat it. And I uh, love his accent. Yeah. It just it does something to you. Yeah, it, it makes it you pay attention. It draws you in. Know, yeah, it what does. It is, but the, the intimacy with God, walking in, in the Spirit. Absolutely. What a tremendous teaching. Very good. Isn't that amazing mm -hmm. how easy and how delicious that is? Mm. And you put like a baked potato, a tossed salad with that, coleslaw, mm -hmm. you have supper. Well, how long did it take? You know, we just made these. Yeah, that's and there was fantastic. only three ingredients. Three ingredients and a little bit of barbecue sauce. And you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Thank you for cooking. Hey, thank mm -hmm. you for tasting. So and thank good. you for joining us because it just wouldn't be the same without our folks. No, we're that's so glad right. you Never. Too. I wish I could send this through the television, too. Smell of vision would be nice, huh? Smell of vision. <laughs> sure about that smell of vision business. But in a moment, we're going to be praying for you and all the prayer requests that have been sent in. You know, we've got Get me people who have connected yes. with prayer. And Arlene is a prayer warrior. Yes. So if you want somebody to pray for you, this is the person to pray. We're going to pray for you. But first, let's, yes. let's see what's coming up tomorrow on Real, Real Life. Life. Yeah. Tomorrow on Real Life, Dr. Kurt Bjorklund discusses the impact of the Holy Spirit as we relate to others. A teen on Today's Girls faces the difficult situation of seeing herself in a video on the internet, drunk at a party. And the prayer ministry of Jason Jablonski. That's tomorrow on Real Life. We're back to pray and you know we like to start our prayers if, if we can with a praise report. Because praise and testimonies build faith. Mm -hmm. So when you hear what God's done with somebody else, you go, wow, that, that encourages you. Mm -hmm. And so Amanda, Valerie called, and she said that uh, God had healed her, raised enough. No, I forget, there was two things. He raised enough for her to have a new windows for her house, which praise God for that. Amen. And he also healed her. Now she can walk without a cane. Amen. And she's thanking Amen. God for Thank healing you. her. You know, our, our Father loves you, and he's, He wants to be involved in your life. And I just want to encourage you. Put your faith out there. you got to stretch a little bit. Sometimes you got to step a little bit. Uh, and I would encourage, Valerie, you to walk more without that cane. Just keep moving. And every step you take, say, I take the step in the name of Jesus. Amen. I take the step in the name Amen. of Jesus. Walk forward. Don't allow yourselves to go back, go forward with your faith. And we've got some prayer requests. Amanda, who, who do well, you have? I have Andrew. He called uh, for deliverance from just emotional issues. And he's in the middle of some marital problems and then has a financial need. So mm. we just thank the Lord for Andrew, God. I thank you that your angels have been given charge round about him. Lord, that he has the peace of God. In him, knowing that you are leading him as he leans on you. In Jesus' name. Yes, 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 Hallelujah. Yes. Thank Peter, you, you have a prayer request. What, what, what's it for? Uh, so Douglas is having some pain in his hip. And also Louise, uh, she is looking for a caregiver. A caregiver. Mm -hmm. I believe God for her to meet that right caregiver. Ted, what, what do you have? Uh, Robin shares, as, as many parents do, concern over her son. And uh, he has anger issues, and is just looking for him to be delivered from that anger, and and her help and assistance with him. Well, Patty's called us for emotional issues, dealing specifically with prayer. I mean, with faith and fear. You know, faith is the other side of fear. So if you are facing fear, you have to do it through faith. You have to believe God's with you and he's with you. And we're going to pray, Patty, just a second for you. And David has many physical infirmities, just lots of things. You know, the body breaks down when it breaks down. You know, we go find a good doctor and put your faith in God. That's the best, that's the best way to approach healing. Find a doctor that you trust, listen to him, but put your faith in God. God can use doctors and he does all the time. But he also can sovereignly and supernaturally touch your body. 
He's a God of the supernatural too. So it's a combination of the two. So put your faith out there and, and also put your feet out there. Step out and do something about it. Let's put these here, guys. And let's put, let's, let's pray together for all of these needs. And for all of you who didn't call in, let me just speak to you. If you didn't call in and you have a need, I want you to believe God for that too. And maybe you don't even know who Jesus is. You've never experienced him as your savior. Would you call the number on the screen, 888-665-4483 and tell our prayer partner you want to know Jesus as your savior. Let's, let's, let's pray. Father God, thank you for every one of these people, Lord, that you love them with an everlasting love. You sent your son Jesus to die for every one of these people, everyone watching the program right now, God. You've got healing. You've got deliverance. You've got restoration. Lord, you've got a, a revitalization in their life, a day of new beginnings, God. We pray for hope to spring up, Lord, and every viewer. Lord, let your hope arise. Lord, we're thankful for your salvation. Lord, we're thankful for the good news of Jesus. Lord, that it is the power of God unto salvation. Lord, I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, for all these answers. Amen. Amen. Well, gentlemen, thank Amen. you for being on our program with yes. us. Thanks for having us. Wonderful. Truly enjoyed Amen. it. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, Amanda, we learned some stuff, too, didn't we? Oh, my goodness. I got to go home and, like, <laughs> take it all in. Take it I'm all in. I'm going to have to watch the program again. Well, you might have to watch it <laughs> Which is there. Let's close this, this group of, of singers, a cappella group from Wake Forest. Such an anointed, blessed group of young ladies as they sing, You Are My God. God bless you.